So I think we can start. Uh, welcome everybody to today's PhD seminar. Uh, today we will have uh, Matteo Moro, he's a PhD student at the beginning of his second year and he's working under the supervision of uh, Francisco Done and Maura Casadio. And today he will talk about uh, uh, pose estimation. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm at the, beginning, at the beginning of the second year and I'm working on uh, yes, pose estimation and uh, human uh, motion analysis. Uh, okay. So at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, uh, I will uh, introduce the concept of pose estimation, even if I know that everyone know it. And then I will present uh, a tool for the pose uh, estimation and the three cases of study that I did in, during my first year of the PhD. So uh, pose uh, estimation is basically detect some uh, jo interesting joints in a figure or in a, in a video. Uh, we detect some joints in uh, a person or people that are in the scene. And then we, we connect these joints, one with the other, to create a skeleton of the person or the people in the image. Uh, why this is important for motion analysis? Because uh, uh, we want to estimate the pose and know the exact position of some joints in the image plane to study how they move in the, in the image plane. And from these points we can uh, detect some use, useful information that can allow us to understand the motion of the people of, or of the person in the scene. So to do that, we decided to, we studied a lot of pose estimation tool and we decided to use this one that is called DeepLab Cut. Actually DeepLab Cut does not allow to reconstruct all the skeleton of the person inside the image but allow to detect some interesting points. We decided to use this because uh, this tool because uh, allow us to choose the points that we, we want to detect in the image. So we can uh, start uh, our analysis and decide uh, which points, what points we want to detect inside the image. Uh, it is based on a uh, deep learning architecture and uh, yes, with, uh, uh, at the beginning we have to start by choosing some images and label each image with the points that we are interested to know where they are in the image plane. So we label, manually label the point and then we train the network to and, uh, train the network, and uh, at the end, it will know where how to detect how to detect these points in the images. So at the end, this is more clear, maybe. So I, I, I'm working with videos. So we have uh, a whole video with a lot of frames. We decide uh, randomly some of this frame and we manually label them and label the points that we want to know where they are where they are in the image we train the network with uh, only these few frames and this is the the points that uh, we were interested to know where they are and at the end, if we, if we give the, uh, to the network the whole video, so with all the frames, the output of the network is the position of uh, each joint that we want to know the position for all the frames in the video. Okay. Uh, 
So as I said before, we decided to use this type of architecture because uh, for each cases we wanted to know different point. So it's not like uh, we want to know each time the pose of the person in the image, but we want to detect some specific point that allow us to do some specific analysis on the motion depending on the case that we are studying. So the first case of study is uh, gate analysis. Gate analysis is, uh, so is typical in the rehabilitation field, the biomedical field, and it's the study of, of how people walk. Gate analysis is useful because at the end of this analysis, we, have some, we extract some parameters that allow us to understand how the person is moving, how it, uh, he's walking and something like this. And it's very useful for, uh, for example, for stroke patients or for multiple sclerosis patients for a rehabilitation task. Because once you know how the people walk, you can also suggest them uh, how to improve the way they work. So uh, now gate analysis is done with a very specific, uh, with a very specific technique that it's based on uh, marker. So you are, you are in a lab, you have a lot of uh, you have uh, an RGB camera and a lot of infrared cameras that are useful to uh, detect the signal that come from markers that are positioned, that are uh, located or in the body of the of the person that is walking. So you have a lot of marker, specifically in this protocol that is called David protocol, uh, you have 21 markers in all your body, and uh, of course uh, all, this all this technique is very uncomfortable for the patients, because you have a lot of markers and you have to walk with uh, the marker on your skin. It's very expensive because uh, uh, it's necessary to have uh, at least usually six infrared cameras and it's a, a motion capture system let's say so what we want to do is uh, try to see if it's possible to extract some parameter of gate analysis using only rgb videos so in uh, all this type of task there is always uh, an rgb camera to give a feedback for clinicians that look at the video and understand how people are moving, okay? But are not used for a quantitative analysis. So again, we have a, a, a data set with, uh, in this case, we have 10 patients. For each patient, uh, we have uh, three videos and they are walking or from one side to the other of the room or vice versa. And depending on that, uh, we know some information about only one part of the body because the, the camera is positioned on the lateral side of the, of the person who is moving. Like this. So you, you see only one part of the person is um, walking in the, in the room and you can analyze only one leg at a time for video. Uh, okay, this is uh, uh, the output uh, of the network. So we train the network that I, that I showed you before and we train it in, in the way to understand where these points are in the image plane. So, in particular, we are interested in the hip, the knee, the, and the foot, basically. Now I show you why we are interested in this point. 
the first thing that we did is, uh, okay, we have this type of information and we have this information. We have the position of each joints in all the frames of the video. So let's see if uh, the position of the frame can be compared with the one obtained with, ma with marker-based analysis, okay? So, uh, under this point, you cannot see them, but under this point, there are markers, because this data set was acquired a long time ago and was based in uh, marker analysis. And so we said, let's see that uh, if we took, if we, if we take only two components of the of the marker signal, because the marker signal is three-dimensional, let's take only the two coordinates that we can uh, extrapolate also from the video, and let's see how the signal of the marker and the markerless are. Okay, and this is the results. The red one is the signal obtained with the marker-based analysis, and it's the evolution of uh, each joint in, uh, in time, actually, for each frame, how the, the coordinates of each joint evolve during time. And the blue one is the signal from the markerless analysis, let's, let's say, the signal obtained with the core with these points, colored points, okay. So as you can see for the hip and the knee, uh, there are two points on the knee only because uh, uh, we have two markers on the knee. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's the protocol of our gate analysis. Uh, as you can see in these cases, uh, the signal are pretty, is pretty good, so it's approximating, approximating uh, pretty well the marker based signal. Instead for the fit it's actually it's not so good. Why? Because uh, uh, during the uh, gait while we are walking the foot is the part that uh, we are moving more, no? Uh, more more fast. Faster. And uh, since these videos are quite old and they are acquired at 25 frames per second, uh, it's a signal very noisy. We have a lot of noise in the signal. And so that's why we do not have the same uh, result. Okay, so once we have uh, so once we have uh, this type of information, uh, we can say, OK, uh, with the markerless analysis, we can approximate quite well the marker-based signal. Let's try to extrapolate the same parameters typical of gate, some of the parameters that are typical of gate analysis. And we decided to some of them. One of them is this one. Now I explain what it is. It's called the stance phase. Okay, so before I have to, to, to explain what is a, a gate cycle, because all of these parameters are computed for a gate cycle, it is the time, so the gate cycle is uh, one gate, one step. So it's the time between uh, the first time that we touch the ground with a certain foot, let's say the right one, and the time between this moment and the moment uh, and the instance where uh, we touch the ground with the same foot in, while we are walking. Okay. The stand the stance phase is the time while we touch the ground with the foot, this specific foot, because during a, a cycle we have uh, a period of time when the foot uh, touch the ground, of course, and this is called the stance phase, and, one, uh, and a certain amount of time uh, while the foot is uh, in the air, is moving uh, forward, okay? This is called the swing, but... Uh, so, the, let's focus. The, the two, uh, these two are one for impaired leg, so, because this uh, data set is about stroke patient. 
So any paretic patient that have uh, half of the body that is unpaired and half of the body that uh, we can say that is uh, unimpaired. So the parameters are uh, computed for the impaired and unimpaired leg, leg separately. In, in this one, we can see the red signal is the mean and the standard deviation of the stance phase computed with the marker-based analysis. And in blue, we have the mean and the standard deviation of the same parameter computed with the markerless one. Okay? And we can see that uh, they are uh, very close one to the other. So what is the meaning of the x and y axis? Sorry. Uh, here is uh, the, the x is the subject. So we had 10 subjects. And it's, uh, so this is the mean and the standard deviation for subject number one. A subject you mean? Patients, see, see, see. And on uh, Y, we have the percentage of, percentage of the cycle, and uh, it means that uh, if you take as 100% uh, the cycle, so this one, how much time you are touching the ground is the stand space. And the other one is exactly the same of this, but computed for the unimpaired leg. OK. So another type of, pat of parameter that uh, we can compute uh, is uh, what is called the elevation angle. So the elevation angle is uh, an angle that is <laughs> Computed, uh, and there are different type of uh, angle that we can compute while we are doing gate analysis. Basically, if uh, this is the leg, uh, so if we have the leg here, this is the hip, let's say, this is the knee, this is the foot, one angle is uh, this one, the one at the hip. Then we can compute as the same angle at the knee, and one angle, of course, at the foot. OK, to understand how people are moving in the sea. OK, to, uh, simply to characterize the motion, to see if they are moving in a correct way or not, in a standard way or not. OK, so we compute the elevation angle with uh, marker-based analysis and we mark uh, with marker less 1. And we see if, so you mean that there's a standard way to work? Yes. Actually, yes. There is a, a pretty, so you have to think that we are in a rehabilitation lab. So all the environment is, uh, is, is fixed. So you have to, to walk in a specific way. Uh, it's not when uh, you are walking in the street. I mean, it can also be when you are walking in the street. But in this specific case, uh, you have a specific way on how you move. Because uh, you have to move. It's like uh, the, the doctor say to you, walk from this point to this point of the room, and, I, and I'm acquiring data on you. Okay? So you are moving precisely. Yes, there is a standard, there is a standard way on we move. The angle that we have at the... Because there is a people who walk uh, on the foot. Uh, uh, yes, but the... Uh, okay, yes, and said, but the angle on which you move, uh, like the, the foot, the... the yes, it's uh, almost the same. And there is not a, a, a specific value, it's a mean and a standard deviation, okay? So if you fall inside this standard deviation, 
you are uh, moving in the standard way. That's okay. So we we compute this type of parameters and uh, we compared marker and markerless uh, parameters. And these are the results. These are uh, uh, this is a t test to see if the uh, one dimensional t test to understand if the if the elevation angles computed in the two different way are uh, the same or not. It can be considered the same of, or not. And uh, as you can see from the above, so the, the angle, this is the angle at the hip, and it's called in a different way simply because we are considering the, seg the segment and not the specific point, but the thick is uh, the shank is the coach, I don't know. So the, the thick is the angle uh, as uh, I show you here before. This one is at the knee, and this one is the one on the foot. So on the first two cases are almost exactly the same. In the, in the last case, they are quite different because of uh, this. Okay, because uh, the signal that we are approximating uh, is not uh, exactly the same. But as we can see, uh, there is no significant difference between the two signals. This is for the healthy leg, the unimpaired one. The we did the same for impaired, the impaired leg, and we could say exactly the same things. In the first two cases, we have a signal very similar one to the other. In the third, in the, in the case of the foot, uh, it's similar, but not as the two before. But there, there is not statistically a difference between them. And then we computed the difference so to see if uh, we were doing something uh, correct. We compute uh, the, so we checked if there is a difference between the impaired and, and the unimpaired leg. Because from, uh, there is a previous study we did this, and we wanted to know if also with the markerless analysis we could uh, see this difference between the unpaired and unimpaired leg. And this, we, this is what we have. So here we did the, always the same t-test, paired with test as before. And here we notice a significant difference in the true signal. So the blue one and the red one. The area, the gray area, means that uh, in this point you have uh, a statistical difference between, uh, a significant difference between the two signals. Okay. So this was a uh, one uh, application. Another, another application was done by a thesis, Luca Garello, and it's about uh, uh, general movements. What are, so the, what are general movements? We are talking about kids. When kids born can burn a term, the, and uh, they burn at term if they burn after the 38th postmenstrual week. They can burn preterm if they burn before this, this time point. Okay. So all the kids have a certain way to move. Why, when they are really small, uh, at the beginning of their, their birth. So this kind of move, this kind of uh, spontaneous moves, are called general movements. There is uh, this uh, Prec, who in, in the 90s, he found this 
spontaneous movements that kids uh, are used to do. And why they are so important? Because if you understand how kids move, how, how kids move, you can understand if they will have some brain issues in the future. Okay, some brain issues due to uh, some motor problem, language problem, something like this. Only by looking at the way they are moving in space. So you have a kit, you put it uh, under a camera, you take a video or you look at him, and uh, on how he, move, he moves, you can, of course, you can predict in some way if he will have or not some brain issues. When this happens, this happens if uh, the, the kid is born preterm. Okay? Okay, now, uh, uh, this is uh, the data set that I will uh, explain is uh, acquired at Gaslini Hospital. In Gaslini they have uh, uh, this kind, they, they usually do this kind of analysis. They have a kit and they look at him and try to understand how he is moving, he, she is moving. So what we want to do is uh, do that in an automatic way. So try to do a video of the kid while he's moving and understand, try to extract some parameter from the video that allow us to understand if he will have or not some brain issues. Okay, now, uh, this is what uh, I was mentioned. Now the analysis of general movements is, is done like this, so, or with markers in the babies, or with a certain kind of accelerometer, or in some way, so in, in, in this case are very, very invasive. Okay, so it's not. Uh -huh. Or we have also other type of uh, computer vision technique that uh, are not quite are not so reliable. So what we did is uh, use the same network as before, the club cut, but trained to understand where the hands and the feet and the nose of the kids were in the image plane. So like this. At the, end of the, at the end of the video, we have the position. We have the position of each joint in the, in the image plane for the whole video. Okay, from this, from, uh, once we have uh, the position of the hand and the feet, we have to do a kind of post-processing, okay. that it's uh, filter the signal. We filter the signal in three different ways. One is at 12 Hz, because human motion is never higher than 12 Hz. So we low pass at 12 Hz the signal, and we, uh, we apply a median filter and uh, at the ratio of the velocity to understand if, uh, so if uh, there is a misprediction of the points, so that if the hand is on certain points in the space and the network mispredicts the position of the hand, it will predict it in another part of the image. And there is a jump between two frames. If the, in one frame is here, and in the frame immediately after is in another part of the image, very far away from the points where it was before, of course there is a misprediction because it cannot be that in one frame the hands move so fast. Okay. I can jump these parts. Okay, 
after we have the position of the joints, we tried to extrapolate some parameters, as before, as for gate analysis, on the good on that can uh, show us how babies are moving in the image plane. So uh, the parameters are the velocity of the hand, the, the velocity of the feet, or the correlation that there is between the, move, the motion of the two ends, and the, some parameters like this. And from these parameters, we tried to classify so th three different tasks. We tried to classify at term and preterm kids. So we have videos from for babies born at term and baby burn preterm. We want to understand if uh, from these features we can uh, classify these two different uh, class at term and preterm. Then, if we consider only preterm kids, we want to understand if they are healthy or not, considering the video took uh, at 40 postmenstrual weeks after the gravidness and uh, after three months. And we want to understand if this class were uh, clearly not small, let's say, if we, we can, uh, if we can uh, separate this class by uh, using the parameters that we extract. And these are the results, so uh, we had an accuracy of uh, almost 93% to in at term versus preterm classification, so we could so it's a pretty good uh, accuracy. Uh, we obtain uh, almost 90% accuracy classifying uh, healthy versus unhealthy kids at three months after birth. And 84.6% considering uh, the video took at 40 postmenstrual weeks. So why there, are, there is this gap between these two? It's due to the fact that uh, after three months after birth are, more f are clear the spontaneous movements of the children, are more evident. Okay. Okay. And then the third application is for a violinist player. Uh, we, want to this, we want to study how violinists move in space, how they move while they are playing an instrument, with, with which angle. Uh, so we want to extract some qua quantitative parameter of the motion of these violinist players. And this is the first uh, data, set that, data set that we have that is uh, uh, multi-view. So we have not only one view, but three different view, views of the scene. So with, the, with this data set, we could uh, try a 3D reconstruction of the person who is playing the violin. And uh, this is. OK, and we did this exactly the same thing. So this is the data. These are only two views, two views of the same uh, person. Then we extract exactly in the same way as before some points in the image. And we reconstruct the 3D scene starting from these different these two different viewpoints. I'm sorry, do you take only points? Uh... Uh, of the players, or also of the violin? Also, of the, so we took also uh, four points on the violin and two points on the bow, because we wanted also to know the position, uh, 
the relative position of the player, the violinist player and the violin. And, uh, and from, uh, from the violinist community, it's quite interesting to understand how, so to have quantitative parameters on how violinist is moving, because they want to know like when they are training, when they are doing class of new violinist player, they want to try to maximize the they want to give them information on how to move their arm or uh, to move their uh, head or something like this to play well. Uh, and this is another type of, uh, so we wanted to know, they want also to know the position of the head respect to the violin. And so we use uh, an actor to understand uh, where the person is looking in the image to understand the position of the head. So uh, what is next now? So what we want to do now is uh, so maximize this uh, 3D reconstruction and do it better, let's say, using uh, all the three different viewpoints and so on. Then we want for, uh, for the kids data set, we want to see if there is a possibility to build a pipeline that allow us to understand the same, the same things that we are doing now but directly from the, the, the video and without extract any quantitative parameters. And for the gate analysis, we want to do, uh, we want to have more dynamic information about the pose of the person who is moving in the scene. That's it. Something uh, yeah. colored Some in the color, image. Yeah. Okay, this is a. It's like a. Without without using that. Yes, it's color. Yes, from the video, and you have to, and then you do a kind of threshold on the and understand the, the exact yeah. point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, actually, I think yeah, so. That if the signal is good. And uh, you colored in a way that you can understand, you can threshold in a strong way. Yeah, it, it depends. Yes, if uh, if the color is very specific, maybe yes. But uh, if you want to use something very ge in general, let's say, uh, to use it in different labs or something like this, maybe it cannot be like, uh, so if uh, you want to use it uh, here, and you color it in... Uh, no, 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 but assume, for instance, in the hospital. You uh, in the same the hospital, hospital, yes, in the same hospital, yes. But if you have, like, a different no. ground... Yes, same. In principle, if you are in the hospital, and you are... So if you are analyzing... The yes, I think. Yes, I think this... And this procedure is better than this. Yeah, maybe yes. This... Uh, maybe you have better procedure. Uh, so this is uh, like put, put a marker, no? It's like uh, yes, you, you don't yes you don't need an infrared, but you have all, uh, always something in the patient. Yes, the, the thing that you want to also avoid is to uh, touch the patient, so to put the patient on the patient something that can uh, be invasive or something like this. So, because so markers are very invasive. This can be also not invasive, but uh, while you are walking, it can uh, goes out uh, something like this. No. But, but 
So you said that to estimate the pose for you know, patient X, they need a, a video of a few frames for that patient. Uh, no, it's not, it's not, it is not necessary. Once you train the network, it can be like you train the network with nine patients for the tenth one. So you have just you need this, an amount of data necessary to train the network. Okay. Once the network is, is trained, if you train the network only on nine patients, and the, it's the, the standard by okay. Yes. So um, okay. how much time does it take to train? To, 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 label the uh, to label the data, not so much because uh, this kind of architecture needs so it's uh, a fine tuning, it's not a, tra a full training. Mm -hmm. And so the labeling part is not so long because uh, you need uh, in the order of uh, 100 of data of images, labeled images, so you can label it. No, 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 100 uh, in total. Okay, so in this case we have nothing in the. So it's a video without nothing, okay? Yes, if you have marker, you, you can affect the, the information of the motion, yes, of course. Because they move in a different way, they have marker or not. Yes, it's like this. Here there is there are no markers, so this is our videos without uh, only the key. Let's say. Are there any constraints about the sampling that you need to train the network, such as uh, how many frames should I consider? How should uh, the space? Uh, how should be the space between one sample and another? I mean, this is uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, the number of the frames that you take, it depends on uh, so how, how many data you have. And uh, so you, you have a data set, okay? And uh, as the, they write in the paper of deep love cut, you need the, you, this is a good network that you do because you need the, a small amount of data. Okay. There is no limitation on the sampling, so you can take it's randomly. You select the frames randomly in the video, so you can take also the first four. Of course, uh, if you have uh, uh, an, so if you have uh, a variety of cases uh, that cover more the motion uh, of the kids, uh, you are doing uh, better. Okay, because you can understand also if in this case of the occlusions where we had to filter the data because we didn't train the network to understand the occlusion, right? So in this case, is then filtered to the network failed in this part. And so it was necessary to post-process the data to delete the part that was uh, not true and put it uh, in the right position. Uh, for the amount of uh, frame that you need, uh, they say, so they say uh, it's true actually, that you need a few. So if, if you have uh, 100 babies, 
you can use also more data for it. if you have a specific task and you want to understand only this 100 data you can also label uh, whatever you want to maximize the precision okay if you want to cost to, to build something in general you can uh, take less data and try to understand how they generalize in this case we we wanted to know so we had a data set and we wanted to know if in this specific data set uh, we obtain uh, good results or not. So we took, uh, in this case of uh, kids, I don't remember because Luca did it, but uh, more than uh, the number of frames that I took for uh, the uh, gate analysis. I don't remember, I don't know the number actually. In this case is 100, in the case of gate analysis is 100 for 10 patients, so not so many. The biogenic sample, do you know if and how are the, the data used by the biogenic expert? Uh, so, uh, this, uh, so the data set is acquired uh, in by the Marquette University, by a biomedical uh, group. And uh, what they want to do is uh, what is called motor learning and uh, motor relearning. So they, the task, it's quite crazy because uh, you have not only one type of violin, but there, there are three different type of violin. One, the classical one, one with the string inverted, and one with the string shuffled randomly. And they want to, by, by giving a different violin, they want to understand how the violinist uh, adapt to this motion, to this change, okay? And they want to see specifically the, the inclination of the head, uh, if they try to touch the string in some way to understand uh, where the correct string is that they have to play or something like that. For the violinist community, it's interesting, like the, the angle at the arm or something like this. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 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 No, okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker.